CSIS 2440 is filmed before a live studio audience. So over the next few days, we're going to be taking a break from PHP. I know, hallelujah, finally Jeff, we're tired of PHP. Well, this is a web programming class, which means we have to cover more than just PHP. In this class, we've already talked about PHP, of course. We also have looked at MySQL, or just databases in general. And when you're doing PHP, you cannot avoid HTML. That's the whole reason we have PHP, is to make HTML. And of course, when you're dealing with HTML, CSS and JavaScript are not far behind. These five technologies, if you know them and you understand them, this is what makes you a good web developer. Even if you're only a front-end developer, still knowing the back-end stuff is useful. Even if you're only a back-end developer, still knowing the front-end stuff is useful. So these are the five key languages, key ideas that you need to be very familiar with. Now, people will argue that don't use MySQL, use something else. Use Oracle, use SQL Server, use Postgres, right? Don't use PHP, use .NET, use Perl, use whatever. Those are arguments for another day, another time. But conceptually, you need to know a back-end language, database language, and then the three front-end languages right here. Okay, that aside, we're going to be moving into some advanced JavaScript talk topics. And when we took CSIS 1430, which was the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript introduction, we got a nice little overview of JavaScript, and we really only learned one main thing, which is that fabulous function called document.getElementById. That's all we really learned. We learned how to manipulate the DOM with that. We learned a little bit about what the DOM was. Well, today and then over the next few days, we're going to start moving towards some little bit more advanced topics. We're going to be looking at variable scope, the window model, functions, and objects. That's all today. In the future, we're going to be looking at some other things. But we're going to start here because these few topics will help kind of bridge the gap between the stuff from 1430 and the stuff that's coming in the next couple of days. Variable scope is something that we've sort of touched on in 1430. The window model, believe it or not, you've kind of seen it. And functions, you've definitely seen. Objects, you probably have not seen, at least not through the CSIS 1430 course. So let's dive right in first and take a look at variable scope. So what I have set up here is just a uh, an empty JavaScript file that's connected up to this HTML file. I'm not even using PHP today, so we don't have to have our servers running or anything. I can just open this up directly in the browser, no problem. So here's the JavaScript file, and we're going to be looking at the different ways you can declare a variable. Well, until 2015, there was only one way to do it, starting from 1997-ish when JavaScript became a thing until right around 2015 or so. The only way to do it was this, var some variable name equals some value. That's it. There was no other way to do it. Sometime around 2015, they had, had a few new ideas to add to this that became pretty much fully 100% supported by about 2019 or sometime around last year or this year, 2020. But right now, this is the new ideas we're about to talk about are fully supported in every browser except for, of course, the browser that shall not be named, Internet Explorer. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening when you declare a variable. The basic idea just in all languages and all techniques of declaring a variable is this. This keyword here, whatever it is, different languages have different keywords. This keyword though says, hey, we're about to make a variable it's talking to the computer itself, to the computer's memory. Hey, computer, I'm about to make a variable and you're gonna call it X. And then you're gonna store the number 10 in that spot in memory. That's it. The real question comes down to, where is this variable accessible from? What's its scope? Where is it born? Where does it die? So var, again, as I mentioned, until just recently, this was the only way to do it. Well, now there are new ways to do it. And so we're going to look at the difference between all of these. The old way, var. One of the new ways, let. Another one of the new ways, const. Now, we're only going to gloss over the surface of this. We're not going to dive too much in depth, but we do need to understand some of the basic differences. And so 
Basic difference number one, let and const are both what are called block level scope. All right, what does that mean? We'll get to that in just a minute. Those are both block level scope. Var is what's called context execution, I believe is the formal term, or execution context probably, execution context scope. All right. What this means in layman terms and for our purposes, and the only way I'm really going to explain it is that using the var keyword makes either a global variable, which is accessible in the entire JavaScript file, or it makes it function level. For our purposes, for our purposes, that's good enough. All right. So let's look at an example of that. Okay. Right now, this variable on line four is being declared just in the document. It's not inside of a function. It's nowhere. It's just sitting in the document. And I can say something like, here's a function and we'll call this function, whatever. And inside of this function, I can access that variable. I can say X equals 11. Okay. So if I console out X console dot log X, and then I call the whatever function, then I console it out again. When line 11 runs, it will console out the number 10. When line 12 runs, it will change this X to the value 11. And then when line 13 runs, it will console out that new value because this variable here is global in scope. So let's take a look at that in the browser. We'll refresh the page, open up our console and you see it printed 10, then 11. Okay. That's global scope. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Okay. Now in most programming languages, you have what's called block scope, which is what we mentioned here in the let and the const. Okay. And the way block scope works, and we'll talk more about this when we actually look at let and const, but the way block scope works is that variable is born and dies inside of the nearest curly braces to it. Right? So, Execution context scope does not quite work like that, right? Execution context scope, basically it works inside the main piece of functioning code that you're dealing with. That's the only way I can think of to say it that's going to not get it too super messy. So in other words, if I decided to declare this inside of this function here, right here, var x equals 10, first of all, this variable right now on line eight, we're going to comment that out on line eight is being declared inside of the function and it now has function scope. So already I just broke lines 12 and line 14. This will not work. If I try to console out X on line 12, the browser is going to throw an error because it doesn't know what X is because console is on the global level. It's outside of the function and it cannot see what's inside of the function. So if I refresh, I get an error right there on line 12. Okay. And you can see the error right there. It says reference X is not defined. doesn't know what the heck X is. Okay. So let's close out this, close the debugger here, switch back to console. Okay. So this is no longer available outside of the function. That's pretty standard behavior in most programming languages. If it's in the function, that's where it lives. If it's outside the function, that's where it lives. And by the way, being outside of a function makes it available inside the function, right? Because imagine a big, huge set of curly braces around the entire document that they're not really there, but just imagine it. And so if this were being declared up here, then it lives and dies inside of these curly braces, right? Now, when I said a minute ago that block level means the nearest curly braces, I don't mean actual proximity. Like this, this, is, this line of code is closer to this one. I mean, if you were to work from the inside out, it's the closest set you would come to, right? But this is not block level scope. This is not block level. So let's get rid of these parentheses here, these curly braces, and let's see what's really going on here. Let's move this back in here. And now if I had, for example, an if statement that says if some other variable y is equal to the value nine, then I want to declare 
variable x to be equal to 10. Okay? So if y equals 9, declare x to be 10. Otherwise, don't do anything, right? So let's make y here. We'll say var y is equal to 9. And so this line on 10 will be true. Therefore, this will be created. Therefore, it will exist, right? So if I say right here, console.log x, it will exist. It will exist in the function. If this variable were block level, it would only exist inside of the if statement. All right, we'll look at that in just a second. But since it is actually execution context level, then it actually is going to be inside the entire function. So if I run this right now, well, y is nine, so this is true. This gets created and everything's gonna be fine. Let's comment these out real quick so we don't get any errors. Just run the whatever function. Refresh. And we get this 10, it prints out no problem because this variable is available to the entire function, okay? If var were block level, like let is, so let's change this to let, suddenly this console.log x will give an error because it is unaware of this x variable because that x variable is born inside these parentheses, or excuse me, these curly braces, and dies in those curly braces. So refresh, and we get this error here. And if you want to see the error, you can just zoom out a little bit and it shows you more details right here, okay? I'm just zoomed in so it kind of hides some of this stuff. All right, so let's close this, go back to the console, zoom back out a little bit, or back in, I should say. All right, so let's go back to var. And now var is available to the entire function. So the simple way to look at this, and it's not quite perfectly 100% this simple, but this is close enough, especially when I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, don't even use var ever. But simply put, var is either going to be function level scope or global scope, the end. If you just think of it in those terms, then you'll be good. So if var is being used anywhere inside of the curly braces for a function, everywhere in that function has access to it. But nowhere outside of the function has access to it. Other functions would not have access to it. If, on the other hand, a variable was declared using the var keyword outside of the function, then it's available everywhere, including all functions that are inside of the, the script as well. That's good enough for var, all right? Now, again, there are some nuances, but we're going to skip that, and we're going to stick with this basic definition we've got here. Okay, let's take a look at let now. We just saw an example of one of the things that's a little bit different with let. Let is block-level scope, and that literally means that it only is available within the block of code where it was born. And what determines a block? The curly braces, right? So if we had some sort of weird scenario where we have a whole bunch of nested curly braces, right? We just had some code here, then we had something else here, and then something else here, right? And this is possible, depending on how your code's structured. And obviously, just a bunch of blank curly braces is silly. But if this were a function, and this were a nested function inside of that, if this were an if statement, if this were a for loop inside of that, and we in here said let w equal 9, this would only be available to those curly braces and nowhere else, only to the block that it's born inside of. For the most part, that's really all we need to know about let. The last one here we're going to look at is const, okay? And const is the same as let as far as the scope. It, it would be, if we used const right here, it would only be available to these curly braces. It would not be available to what's inside of this curly brace or this one or this one, okay? The main difference is this. With const, you cannot change this value later in the code. So let's use some examples here. Let's clean this up, get rid of all of this, and let's go with let x equal 10. And then later I'm gonna say console.log x, and then I'm gonna say x is now equal to 12, and then we'll console that out. And so this will easily print out a 10, and then print out a 12, no problem. Refresh, and there we go, 10, 12. If, however, this was a const, short for constant, not a variable, right? No, sorry, just const, I said the word and I typed it, const. 
when I refresh, I get an error because you cannot change a constant value, right? If we look at the error, assignment to constant variable, that's not allowed, okay? So let's stop that from going, go back into here, and change this back to let, and then everything will be fine. So why would we do that, right? Why would we want to do that where we can't change something? Well, there's lots of examples. The first thing I want to point out, though, is in the industry, I see a lot of different scenarios where people use const in a way that I think they should not use const, okay? Yes, but there may be a case here where I have no reason to believe that X will ever be changed in the code, and since I wrote the code, I know I won't be changing it anywhere, so let's just call it const X equals 10. Well, what's the point of that? In my opinion, when you're using a variable, it's called a variable for a reason. It's going to change. Well, maybe the core, maybe in the code you're going to increment it. If you have a counter, you can't do that with a const. Maybe you're going to do some math on it and reassign it. There's lots of different reasons why the value of a variable would change. In my opinion, the only time I use const is for situations like this. Maybe I've got a game where I need to keep track of the effects of gravity on my players and so I have some sort of constant that I call gravity and I set it equal to 9.8 what is it meters per second per second or something like that but I set it to 9.8 that number is never going to change the the gravity constant doesn't change ever right and if somehow the world of physics changed and gravity constant was no longer 9.8 okay well I'll come in my code and I'll change it to 6.8 or whatever the new gravity is okay but that value throughout the code is a constant value that never ever changes. For my code, that's what I prefer. Maybe I have a constant that's called C for the speed of light and it's whatever. I don't remember what the speed of light is, okay? What the speed of light constant is, but that would be a constant there and I use capitals for all my constants. That would never change. For everything else, just use let. Let x equal 10. And it even sounds nice. This is actually back in the day with the basic programming language. That is how you declared a variable. You said let x equal 10. And I like the way that sounds. I shall let this variable called x be equal to the value 10. I just like the way that sounds. Let x equal 10. Don't use var. It's messy. It's very messy. Let's clear. Wherever the curly braces are, that's where let lives and dies, within those curly braces. If it happens to be outside of all curly braces, then it is global in scope, right? So if we go back to this function we had a few minutes ago called function whatever, and inside of there, we change the value of X to set it to be 99, and then we call the whatever function right here, we are still accessing this global variable here inside of this function. So this output on 11 will give us 10, 13 will give us 99. We refresh we see that's exactly what happens so as far as when it goes when it comes to global variables let or var doesn't matter they're both if they're declared outside of any specific function they both have global scope the difference is however that when using let it becomes a block level scope and it is lives and dies within the nearest curly brace that it's inside of Hopefully that makes some sense there. There are other things, lots of other things, but these are the main ones, okay? These are the main differences. And when it comes right down to it, there's really no need to use var. I don't use it really anymore. The only other thing I wanna to add to this is a little extra piece of information about const, okay? Const is a little trickier than you might think. So let's go back to creating a const x equals 10 and anywhere in the code after that, if I try to set x equal to 99, I'll just get an error. Refresh, and I get an error. That's no good, okay? But we're not, the problem isn't that we're changing this value. What's happened here, x is actually blocked out a spot in memory that's meant to hold this integer here. And so this x is pointing to a spot in memory. And if you understand pointers, maybe that'll help. But if you don't understand pointers, this can be very tricky. So what can't be changed is where this X is pointing to in memory, right? 
this X is pointing to a particular place in the memory. And so I can't, I can't do anything about that. There is a 10 in that spot in memory. It's stuck there. The moment I say X is equal to something else, I'm trying to point it away from that spot in memory. That's no good. However, you can, let's say for example, X were actually an array of some numbers, 99, 21, 42. X is an array of numbers. Well, X is pointing to a spot in memory that's holding an array. Well, I can change what's in that array because I'm not changing the place that X is pointing to. X is pointing to the spot that's holding the array. Okay, so I'm not changing where it's pointing to. So I could, if I wanted to, say X zero equals nine. And if I were to console out this entire array before and after doing that, we would get two different things. So I'll do console out the array and then we'll console it out again. And this number right here will be nine the second time we print it out. So here we go, refresh, go back to the console here. When we refresh it, we see that the first time it displays 10, 99, 21, 42. But the second time, this value has changed. And in fact, if I wanted to add to it, maybe I will do right here, I'll say X and I'll add a fifth element, or excuse me, a four, and set that equal to 109. Now when I refresh, I add it to the array, no problem. So if you understand pointers, that'll probably make sense. If you don't understand pointers, probably won't. All of that is okay if you only use constants when you're really truly dealing with something that you want to represent a constant value that just doesn't change. In my opinion, that's the only way to use const. For everything else, use let, stay away from var. All right, having said all of that, there is one little sort of catch here. It is possible to simply say x equals 10 without putting var, let, or const. That's totally legitimate. So I can say console.log x, and then I can now say x equals 9, and I'll console it out again. And then when I refresh it, I get 10 and 9, no problem. The scope on this is a little bit weird, and all documentation says it's discouraged that you do this, okay? The only time it's actually the right thing to do is when you're dealing with a parameter of a function. So, for example, we have a function. It's called add to numbers. And it takes in number one and number two. And then it simply consoles out num one plus num two. And we're gonna parse int those just to make sure they actually get processed as numbers parse int. Okay. So that's it. When, if I call this function, it'll simply say add two numbers. I'll pass in 10 and 15. The number 10 is the argument that gets handed off to this variable called number one. The argument 15 gets handed off to num two, and then those two are added together and consoled out. So we should get 25 on the console. So refresh and we get 25. Okay, notice I did not say var num or let num or const num, okay? I just put the variable parameter. This situation where it's declared inside of the parameter parentheses of the function name, the function signature, if you will, those live and die in the function. That's it, they're not global, they live and die in the function. And in fact, if I had outside of here something called var num, which is a var num one, and it's equal to 900, that is a global variable. Yet it is not this one. This this one here on line six. Let me get my little mark board, my whiteboard out to make that a little bit more clear. So this number one right here is not this, or a better way to say it, is that even though this is global, this is not referring to that global variable. This is referring to itself, and it's holding this value. 
right? So let's see that in action. We'll go back here, let's make sure we save it and then refresh it. And if I refresh, we still get the number 25, even though I have this thing called num1, which is equal to 900, okay? Now, if I were not accepting, if I did not create a parameter here on line six called num1, and I didn't pass in something to that parameter. Well, now this num1 here on line eight is referring to the global one because there is no other num1 anywhere in the world. So now when I refresh it, of course, the number will be 915. Okay, so that's the four different ways you can declare variables, var, let, const, no keyword. Var, don't use it. Let, use it for everything except for the time when you know you want to create a completely constant value that never changes. And in that scenario, use const. And as far as using the, we'll go with the no keyword, use that only as a function parameter, like we did right here. Okay, that is it for variable scope. Next up on the agenda, we're going to spend a moment talking briefly about the window model, okay? So the first thing to understand is that the window, the actual object called window, is the great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother, grandparent of them all, right? We already know about the document, right? We learned about the document in 1430. Okay, so let's take a look at this on the whiteboard here. So you recall back in the HTML days, we learned about the HTML tag has only two children, right? It has the head tag and it has the body tag. That's it. That body had things like title, meta, link, style, source. The head tag has all those. The body tag has things like Anchor tags, H1s, divs, spans, sections, whatever, all kinds of different stuff, right? But this is the parent of them all, the top parent of everything. Well, we later learned in that same class that HTML has a parent, and it is the document. Well, it turns out the document also has a parent. Not only that, but it has a sibling. So the document's parent is the window. That is the highest we go, the window. The window has another child called the screen. These are all objects, right? The document is an object and is a child of window. The screen is an object and it is a child of the window, okay? So there's the entire real true hierarchy of everything. But why does this matter? Well, there's lots of cool things we're going to learn about that you can do with this in future videos, but we're going to sort of take a peek at some of that right now. Okay, we already know about the document, right? We know that if we go into the browser here and we look at the elements and we pick something here, the body, which is just blank at the moment, but we go down to this section here to properties and I can expand the body and I'm seeing this is all stuff that's in the document. It's part of the document. I can manipulate the last child property of the body, or I can manipulate the child nodes or the attributes or whatever, right? We can manipulate all this stuff in the DOM using JavaScript, lots of different ways. The only way we learned how to do that though was using document.getElementById. That's a function that's part of the document. And again, the document is a child of the window. Well, the window, let's open up another tab here. Now I have two tabs here. Each tab has its own window object. So let's just go back to the MDN page here. And now this right here, let's open up the console, has its own window object. If I go to the console and I type in window, there is a window object and you see inside this object, everything. There's the document, that's part of it. It has all kinds of stuff here. What browser or what page maybe we're looking at? It has things like location, if we find down here. Location, well, where's the location? Well, it's this is the website right here. This is the actual href and so on down the line. There's all kinds of fun stuff in here, okay? Lots of different things. If I come over here and look at this one, go back to the console, type in window. 
it is also an object, but it's a different object than the other tab. So if I look here, drop down, and we'll go down to location on this one, alphabetically here, and location. Where is location? It's just my local file path. It's nowhere fancy, okay? There are things in here like the inner width, inner height of the window right here. So this is the height of the window, the width. This stuff can be used to do lots of different fun calculations in your JavaScript for when the window gets resized, all kinds of different things, okay? So that's the window. There's also the screen object. If we go back to the console up here, we'll clear it out and type in screen. And here is the screen object. And there's not a lot here, but there's there's a lot of things you can do with this, okay? So we're not going get to in, get into any of the uses for any of these things today. We will get into some of the uses for the window object in future videos, but I just want to sort of expose this to you and then show you one other thing that takes us back to our variable scope discussion from a moment ago. So let's clear this out here and let's just make a variable called var x equals 10. Okay, this x right here, when it's global, it becomes part of the window. It's actually now a property of the window. So if I refresh this page right here and I type in the window object and I look at down here, alphabetically find the word x, and there it is. That is a, a property of the window. Okay. Now, if X were declared inside of a function, then this would not be a thing. Okay. So if we just had something like function, whatever, and inside the function, we declared this variable X refresh go back to window. And we look down here, try to find X and you'll find that it does not exist anywhere down here. We went from S, T, V, W, and there's no X, okay? Now, if we go back to this being global, we will see it comes back, so let's make sure it comes back, okay? Whoops, that should be all lowercase. What are you doing? Window, there we go, okay? And again, if we scroll down, the X will be there. Just wanna prove that. And there it is right there at the bottom of, after window. Now. If this were let, however, or const, either of those two, it does not become a property of the window, even though it is global. So here we go, refresh, window, scroll down, and find that we get to the bottom alphabetically, and there is no X. So that's just one little extra piece about the global versions of var versus let. Bottom line, I'm pretty sure someday they're just going to make that no longer even work, var. No longer work so we're going to stick with let const or no keyword when we're doing function parameters and that's it okay so we'll see more about the window object later i just wanted to introduce it to you let you know that it is there and it is available and there are things and properties in there that you can manipulate and that you can do things with and so we're going to learn later how to attach an event handler to the entire window so that if anything happens in the window, a click, a mouse move, or whatever, we can capture it and do something with it. So we'll see that in a future video. But for now, we're done with this window model topic. Okay, next up, we're gonna be talking about functions. Now, you already know about functions. We've been talking about functions today already, but we're gonna get into some specifics and some other things that we didn't look at before, okay? So let's start with the basics here. Let's talk about regular functions. We'll talk about anonymous, anonymous functions, and we'll talk about arrow functions, okay? And a little bit later, when we get into classes, we will also talk about constructor functions, okay? But that's gonna be part of the class discussion. So we'll kind of leave that one away for now, okay? Regular functions, we know how to do this. I wanna make a function that does some math or prints something out or whatever. I just call it function and then I give it a name. So we'll call it multiply, right? And it's gonna take in two parameters, X and Y, and then we'll just simply say console.log X times Y. That's it, okay? If I call the multiply function, multiply 10 comma 20, that'll return 200. If I put in 
4 comma 5 that'll return 20 all right so here we go we'll refresh and we get 200 and we get 20 right that's a function we've seen it a million times we also know that it can return values so instead of canceling this out we will say return x times y now we can't just run these functions because it won't do anything this will just become 200 this will just become 20 so we need to echo those out or console those out or add them to the dom or whatever we're going to do we'll just go with console.log close out of parentheses here and so the difference when we return a value is the function call itself just becomes that value that becomes 200 and this becomes 20 right so when I print it out, when I run it, the output's the same. But that's two basic kinds of functions, right? One that returns something, one that doesn't. Also, you can take in multiple parameters, right? I can have a third parameter that's going to multiply three things together. And we'll put right here, multiply that times z. We'll pass in another number here, 2 and 3 or 4. And now we get this new calculation here. So multiple parameters. I can also have no parameters, right? I can have no parameters. Well, we can't really return x, y, and z now because those don't exist. So we can just return something like, I don't know, I wish I had something to multiply, right? Something like that. And then we call the multiply function with no parameters because it doesn't have any parameter variables, right? So I refresh it now and it just says, I wish I had something to multiply, okay? So you can have functions with parameters, without parameters, things that return stuff, things that don't return things, right? So that's the basic stuff. We've already looked at that. There's one last thing I want to throw in there. Let's go back to what we had a minute ago. And what you can do here is also have a default value for a function, right? So I can say the default value for z is 0. So if they do not pass in a z variable right here, then it will use z instead. So let's just leave off z here. So now this function here, the first one, it passes in the number 10 to the x, it passes the number 20 to the y, passes the number 2 to the z. That'll give us 10 times 20 times 2. This one passes the 4 off to the x, the 5 off to the y, and there is no z. So z just becomes or stays 0. So when I run this, we get the output of 400 for the first one and 0 for the second one. Now you can have multiple default values, one for, you can have multiple variables with default values. That's a better way to say that. So maybe the default value for y is 10. Okay. So now if I leave this off and we'll change this default to be equal to 2. So this right here is still going to multiply 10 times 20 times 2. But this one's going to multiply 4 times 10 times 2. Right? So if I refresh it, we see 4 times 10 times 2 is 40, and the top one's data 400. Now the catch with this is you can't have a default here in the middle, but not one at the end. Okay, if you do that, then there, there can be some issues, right? This 4 easily goes to x, but okay, what if I have a second number that's supposed to be z right there? Well, the program's going to think, well, that 5 belongs to the y. It's not sure what to do. Then it's like, okay, well, where's the z variable, right? So it can get a little messy and confusing. So when you have multiple default values, you want to make sure that they're at the end of the equation, or excuse me, the end of the function, the end of the function signature, the end of the parameter list. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, so there we go. That's basic, basic function stuff, things we've already known. Well, there's also what's known as an anonymous function, okay? So I can just do this. I can actually set that as a function without a name. Okay, now I can't call it because it doesn't have a name anymore, but what I can do is assign its output to a variable. So let's clean all this up here and make a simple little thing here. Let's get rid of the parameters for just a moment. And this function here 
is just going to return seven. That's all it's gonna do, right? Nothing simple, nothing extravagant, okay? Well, when I refresh the page, there's nothing happening here because it's gonna be an error because this function doesn't have a name. But Jeff, you just said I can make it without a name. You can, but you have to assign it somewhere or you have to use it as a parameter or something, right? So for example, I could say let x equal function return seven. And now that I've signed this X here and I run it, if I refresh it and I type in X here, it doesn't give me the value seven. It actually gives me what X is set to. It's set to this function here, right? It's kind of weird. So if I, if I decide to call X like so with no parameters or anything, cause there, it doesn't take any, and then I refresh it, or if I just say here, X, then it gives me a seven. So if I want to see that on the console, I'd have to type console.log, right, to do that. That would echo out seven. Or I can just manually call the function here in the console. So why would we do this? This seems a little bit weird, right, to do this. Well, when we get to arrow functions here in just a moment, we'll see this. And when we get to classes and objects, you'll see how this can be useful or how this syntax comes into play. Okay, so that's the basics of anonymous function. It's technically not named, but we're assigning it to x, which makes it seem like its name is x, right? Very bizarre, but you'll see this in some future applications. Okay, so that's it for anonymous for now. Let's take a look at this whole arrow function. This is actually a brand new thing and it's got pretty solid browser support with, of course, the exception of Internet Explorer. Other than that, it works pretty much in every browser, okay? So what the heck is it? Well, it's just a shortcut for creating a function. It's just shorter syntax, okay? And so what it comes down to is rather than using the keyword function, I can use this little arrow operator here, which is like looks like the equal sign and the greater than sign, because that's what it is, right? But the syntax, the way it works is you this parentheses here, you say these parentheses are that content right there, and get rid of the keyword function. That's it. So that's the new X is now this function here on the screen. And it's the same thing as what we just had a second ago by doing this function parentheses, right? It's these two lines are equivalent, right? So let's just prove that. I'll call this function Y and we'll console out this function here. And you'll see when I refresh it, they both print out seven, right? You just change the X to return 17. And you can see they are both just functions that are anonymous, but their value, their, not their values, but their, the function is being assigned to X or Y in this case, right? So this syntax right here, it looks like this for the most part, right? It's the parentheses, which means it's gonna be a function and here's the actual function code. So it's a fun little weird looking thing right there, okay? But there are some modifications you can make to it. Right, you can also take in parameters, for example. So I can say, we'll call this one add, and this will return, we'll take x comma y, and this will return parse int x plus parse int y, right? And so this is just the regular old function code, and it doesn't have to be on one line like this, but that's pretty common when it's a short function using this syntax, you'll see that. And so we have X and Y. So now when I call this function here, it's no longer a function called X, it's called Y, or it's not a function called X or a function called Y. It's a function that's anonymous that's being assigned to the word add, right? That's the proper way to say that. But we're gonna pass in two numbers here, 10, 20. So again, the 10 will go to the X, the 20 will go to the Y. It'll do the math and it'll return the value which will get canceled out right there as 30. Okay, well, sometimes you only need one parameter, right? 
Maybe I want to double the number. So we'll have a function here that's going to be anonymous called double using the arrow syntax. Oh, double it. That's a keyword. I can't use that. And it's only one parameter, x. And we're just going to return x times x, right? That's easy enough. Okay. So let's run this. We'll call the double it right here, double it, and we'll pass in nine. So that should give us 81. Refresh, poof, 81. However, in this case, since there's only one parameter, you're allowed to remove the parentheses, which looks crazy, right? But believe it or not, that works. That's a, an anonymous function that takes in a parameter called x right here, and then it returns x times itself and we're assigning this function to the double it variable here so if i run this we still get 81. kooky right i do not recommend that syntax it's messy it's scary but wait there's more it can get even crazier okay so for example you can if if you have a whole bunch of code that's going to be in here you definitely need the curly braces here but if you have a long line, a simple single line of code, you can just put parentheses on it and omit the word return. And this will know that it's supposed to return x times x. All right, so let's refresh. Oh, sorry, that semicolon should not be there. Sorry about that. Okay, so now if I refresh it, we still get the 81. So if I am just returning a value, that value can be very complicated, very complex with lots of math and concatenation and stuff going on. But if it's just returning a value, then you can eliminate the curly braces and eliminate the return keyword and eliminate the semicolon and put it all in parentheses. And now you have an anonymous function that takes in a parameter called X and this is what the function does. It returns, that's implied, x times x. And this whole anonymous function is being assigned to this variable called double it. Crazy, right? But it gets kookier. You ready? Okay. I can actually remove those parentheses. Look at this. So now this is the same thing. It'll return 81, because we're passing a nine right here. And remember, also, if it's only one parameter, right, we can leave off the parentheses there and still get this 81. This is dangerous syntax, if you ask me. It can get very messy and very weird, right? This, this seems like I'm comparing is x greater than or equal to x times. It's just weird, right? Okay, so I recommend at the very least make sure you have parentheses around your parameter, which you have to do anyway if there's more than one parameter. And even if you're going to use this returnless keyword syntax here, please put parentheses on there. But my vote is to go this route right here. Okay, or sorry, this route with the curly braces right there. So arrow functions, for the most part, they're just a syntactic shortcut. That's really their main function and purpose. There's more. And some wonky things can happen when you use them inside of a class. But for the most part, this is all we're really going to care about. Okay, so that is it for functions for now.